Happy St. Patrick's Day, Seattle. My name is Sophie Egan. I am a contributor to the New York Times Health section, founder of Full Table Solutions, which is a consulting practice that's accelerating solutions at the intersection of food, health, and climate. And I'm here today as author of How to Be a Conscious Eater, making food choices that are good for you, others, and the planet. I'm excited to share with you the Conscious Eater framework and how you might think of it in relationship to Irish food as you celebrate this year's Irish festival and this year's St. Patrick's Day. So how to be a conscious eater is all about aligning your food choices with your values. It's empowering you to vote with your fork, as it is said, in addition to voting with your vote, which is very important, uh, in favor of a more delicious, nutritious, sustainable, just, equitable, and resilient food system for the long haul. So it's a three-part mental checklist aimed at helping you navigate the misinformation, the disinformation, the information overload, and the decision fatigue that so many of us are battling as we decide what the heck to eat, uh, which foods are worthy of going in your grocery basket and ultimately coming home with you to go in your bodies and on your plates and your dinner tables. So the three-part checklist is asking yourself a series of these three questions. Is this food good for me? Is it good for others? And is it good for the planet? Is it good for me? Seems pretty straightforward. It's mostly about health and nutrition. Uh, it's really asking, are you eating mostly whole, minimally processed, uh, diverse and uh, nourishing foods whenever possible? But it's also asking about happiness, joy, pleasure. Does it not only do a body good, but does it bring you joy? Does it make you... Um, nostalgic? Does it make you feel connected to friends, to heritage, to, to, to tradition, religion, uh, and all of those more mental and social elements as well? It's about the whole you, in other words. Is it good for others? This looks at all the animals and people affected from farm to table, farm to fork, farm to grocery basket, as it may be, uh, really looking at animal and social welfare. And then lastly, is it good for the planet? This is about carbon footprint, water footprint, but also things like impacts on surrounding ecosystems, biodiversity, uh, pollinator protection, and soil health. The broad set of environmental issues um, that really can result from agriculture depending on which types of practices are used. The book is divided into four parts. It's stuff that comes from the ground, stuff that comes from animals, stuff that comes from factories, and stuff that comes from restaurant kitchens. Altogether, it's 60 short and sweet essays that provide bottom line answers to the most top of mind questions about what is worth your food, food dollars, your hard earned grocery dollars. In the context uh, of, of today's talk, I wanted to just share kind of three main takeaways from the book. So one is that food is one of the most overlooked yet most powerful tools for climate action at your disposal as an individual. Most often when we think about climate change, we think about renewable energy, which is important, uh, transportation, which is also important, things like wind turbines and electric vehicles, and all of those definitely matter. But if you look at the list of most impactful climate solutions that the globe has at its disposal, in reality, food and ag are among the top of the list. Things like, especially for you as an individual or as a household, things like wasting less food, and eating a plant-rich, or what's also called flexitarian, or plant-forward, or plant-centric diet. Doesn't mean all vegan, vegetarian, necessarily. If you are, that's great. But it really just means an emphasis on foods that come from the plant kingdom, because they tend to have a lower impact um, on, across the board environmentally. Eating a plant-rich diet is also one of the most uh, effective, kind of bang-for-your-buck strategies you can take to optimize your own health. So what you'll see throughout the book is lots of win-wins or win-win-wins across all three uh, dimensions. Because really this book with those three questions is trying to broaden your set of apertures, the lenses through which you evaluate foods and their merits, their relative merits. Another major point that I, I hope comes through in the book and that is important for you to know as you think about conscious eating, whether you read the book or not, um, is that it's much more important what you do throughout your lifetime than the diet you adhere to for a week or a month or a summer. So this uh, mental checklist, uh, as I've called it, is really a guide for the long haul. It's evergreen. It can equip you 
for whatever comes your way, new medical issues you may be dealing with, new life experiences, having children, uh, moving to a new city with different options, all of those kinds of circumstantial changes. And it's really, it's really about though this long-term journey because the third main takeaway is that we cannot let perfect be the enemy of the good. So often it is perceived as giving up all the things you love most and sacrifice and deprivation. Uh, but this is not a diet. This is not about that. This is actually about the delicious discovery, the diversity of foods that actually most of the time we aren't getting to enjoy um, because we're eating a lot of the same boring foods that are also not best for us, others, or the planet. Uh, so this is about all the opportunities to be gained. Uh, and that's really important that we keep that in mind as we see that, again, this is a long-term effort and, and you may never reach the finish line, so to speak. The other major point is really thinking, really understanding that your individual choices do make a difference, a huge difference. It doesn't always feel that way. Uh, but in the aggregate, the, co the collective uh, of us all together as consumers, sending market signals is incredibly impactful, uh, both for rewarding companies that are doing things better in terms of more ethical, more sustainable, more nutritionally dense options that they're providing us, um, but also in terms of sending signals to one another. That's a huge difference what you do, what I do, what my friend, my neighbor, my colleagues, um, my sister, what all of those folks do, because together it creates cultural norms. And cultural and social norms are one of the most powerful levers for behavior change. Uh, and, and really you have to embrace the empowerment that you have as an individual uh, to use your, your food decisions um, to, as, as I've said, align your food choices with your values and demonstrate those to the world. Voting with your vote is very important. Voting with your fork is, and your grocery basket are also incredibly important. What does all this mean in celebration of St. Patrick's Day and in the context of Irish food? What I wanted to share with you is three examples of how conscious eating from my perspective is inherently already ingrained in so much of the traditional foods of Irish cuisine. One example is Irish oats, the love of oatmeal, porridge, barley, the like, uh, a warm bowl of whatever your favorite whole grain, but traditionally oats, oatmeal. I personally eat oatmeal every single morning. I look forward to it very much the night before. I know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit it. <laughs> um, but it's delicious, it's filling, it's so, so healthy, and it's, it's really one of those win-win-wins because it's also not got any social baggage that I'm particularly aware of and has a low environmental footprint overall. It's also uh, incredibly uh, important to eat whole grains. Americans overall and, and around the world, it's, it's quite common not to eat nearly enough whole grains compared to what would be optimal for human health. It's tied to tons of uh, chronic disease prevention um, and is basically the difference from, from whole grains and, and refined grains, the kind of white flour, is that it still has the germ and the bran in that grain kernel. And that's the nutritional mojo. That's by far the best part of the grain uh, for our health. It's also really affordable. Think of a tub of oats, like $4. You can have uh, breakfast for, you know, that's 13 cents uh, per serving. Even if you doll it up, get really fancy with dried fruit and nuts and so forth, maybe you're breaking a dollar per serving. Uh, and it's an example of a really important message, which is that conscious eating is by no means only for the elite. And in fact, often aligning what's good for us others in the planet is also aligned with what's best for our budgets, for our our wallets. A second example in the context of Irish food is the love of shellfish. Think of everything from cockles, clams, mussels, uh, oysters for sure. These lower on the food chain, uh, low trophic shellfish seafood species are really important. It's actually one of the main uh, pieces of advice for how to eat seafood that's really good for us, healthy fats, all kinds of other good things, um, nutrients, but also really low impact on, on the oceans. So often it seems like it's this tough choice of, well, I wanna eat fish and seafood, but aren't we depleting the oceans of all the types of species? And this is where a greater diversity of seafood species is really important, as well as eating those lower on the food chain. In the context of mollusks, why they're so great environmentally, uh, is that they are at the bivalves aren't carnivores. So as a general rule, farmed mollusks, farmed bivalves tend to be 
um, don't have a lot of the issues that some of the carnivorous fish have in terms of needing to eat other fish. And that adds up to lots of feed requirements and so forth. Irish food also has a love of, of herring and other oily small fish that are typically the feed that you feed to, uh, to farmed fish. Um, and those are delicious and so healthy and, and environmentally excellent uh, to eat directly. The other great thing about bivalves is they actually leave the waterways, leave the waterways around them uh, cleaner for their having taken up residence there. So loving uh, those options and thinking of all kinds of different, you know, chowder and other dishes in, in Irish cuisine is a great example. And lastly, vegetables. So you might come to think of Irish food as mostly corned beef and that kind of, you know, the, the full Irish breakfast of a bacon, sausage, and so forth. Um, but actually, there's a ton of great vegetable-based dishes. Think of soups, right? A cold, drizzly night. Um, what could be better than, you know, leek or potato soup? Uh, maybe carrots or other kind of tubers, right? Um, parsnips and the like. And then also... The classic Irish stew, which typically has mutton, is increasingly being embraced by vegetarians and vegans. Uh, many Irish citizens are eating more plant-centric, for the reason I mentioned, um, and have found the vegetarian versions of those, just loaded up with vegetables, um, are equally delicious and, and not missing out on, on the red meat. One note on potatoes, which I must mention. Maybe you're thinking of Colcannon, a traditional dish of, you know, potatoes and chives and spring onions. Who doesn't love spring onions, right? Um, potatoes are central to Irish food, but they offer a bit of a cautionary tale in one key area, and that is biodiversity. So one of the increasing alarm bells that's being sounded at the intersection of food, health, and climate is for greater agrobiodiversity. And this basically means not just relying on a handful, a small number of crop, crops and planting them in mass quantities, monoculture, but greatly diversifying the total number of species in our food supply. And you can see why in the, in the case of Irish potato famine, it was an example of when, um, when you're overly reliant on one type of food for food security poses a real, real threat uh, to, to populations regionally. But as we're all interconnected through global supply chains, this can also be the case uh, more broadly. And so, especially if you think about climate change, extreme weather patterns, um, more and more unpredictable issues like that that can wipe out entire entire harvests this topic is really really important so enjoy potatoes absolutely but also embrace the the uh the call for greater biodiversity in our diets and greater biodiversity throughout our food system for the sake of long-term resilience and long-term food security so those are some big picture topics just to describe how these humble uh, Irish foods are actually nutritional and environmental superheroes and also where there's some other key learnings that we can take forward with us as we are taking the St. Patrick's Day feast as a chance to celebrate the ways that uh, many of these Irish foods are already uh, inherently demonstrating how conscious of, uh, of an eater you already are. Um, one thought to leave you with is that I hope you have a fantastic Irish feast, and it's really less critically important for your own health and that of others and, and the planet, that you worry about what you eat on special occasions, on holidays, on vacation, on your birthday. Uh, what matters most is the daily choices, the weekly, you know, your weekday lunch, your morning coffee ritual. Those choices really add up in terms of their total footprint far more. And it also leaves room for that key word in flexitarian, um, or key term, which is flex. Flexibility is the key um, to long-term sustainability of this way of eating. Uh, but it's also inherent, I would say, in the Irish way of eating, which is to take the, the time to, to celebrate things that are more scarce, that are more precious, that are more special occasion, uh, while also eating in really nourishing ways like your everyday oatmeal. So I hope uh, I hope these messages are welcome as you gather around your table for a special St. Patrick's Day meal, and I sure hope it is a delicious one. Take care.